Ready? Okay. Oh, we're live? Oh, hey, we're live. All right. We're, welcome back. I was having such a good conversation. I forgot we were supposed to go live. So we're back at Metabolic Health Summit 2022. And I'm joined by Dr. Jack Feldman, uh, professor at UCLA. Now, as I'm looking through the topics, I see, you know, this one's about nutrition. This one's about exercise. This one's about ketones. And then I came across one that's about breathing. And I thought, well, now that sounds interesting. How are we going to tie this in? So I had to bring Jack down to interview him to hear about the connection and what you're going to talk about later today about breathing and the importance for metabolic health or health in general. When I was asked by Angela to uh, come here and lecture, I said, I normally don't think about metabolism. Clearly, breathing is important because we need it to regulate oxygen and carbon dioxide, which are essential for metabolism. And we do use about 7% of our metabolism for the physical process of breathing. So clearly it's tied in. I think that the current interest in breathing that may tie in mostly to the individuals at this meeting is about the resurgence of the interest in breath work. Now to be candid, that's not my wheelhouse. Um, the way I describe it to people is that we know breathing practice can have profound effect on emotional and cognitive state and health in general, including metabolism. And so this has been known for thousands of years. We're, I have no claim to any particular insight or inventions with respect to that. And that's a little bit like teaching people how to drive a car. That is, you have a steering wheel, you got a, um, a brake, but they don't have to know what it's connected to. They just have to know the phenomenology. So breathing practice is by engaging in a variety of different breathing patterns, there are well-documented and mostly positive effects on health. And for me, my interest has been on the engine side. So when you learn how to drive a car, you don't have to know how an engine works, but uh, my interest is basic, basically to try and figure out how the brain works. And breathing seemed to be a problem that was eminently tractable. But the first thing that we had to do was figure out where the engine was. And we did that and we named it. Uh, it's called the Prebutzinger Complex. And we've been spending a, a significant amount of our time trying to figure out how the brain is able to produce this breathing rhythm, which is extraordinarily reliable. You're doing it 24 7, 365, maybe 600 million breaths in a single lifetime, maybe a billion. So it has to be extremely reliable, and it doesn't suddenly fail on you. Yeah. you know, but there are also a lot of dysfunctions of breathing. We have things like sleep apnea. We have uh, mutations of genes that cause things like Rett syndrome or central congenital hyperventilation syndrome. And my interest is trying to figure out how those things are manifested within the brain. So what, what, sort of my goal here is to give people sort of a, a a dive, hopefully not too deep a dive, into what's actually going on inside their brains that are allowing them to breathe. And then from there, how it ties into uh, metabolism is a little bit of a reach right now, but I want to talk a little bit about what our ideas are for how breathing can affect emotional and cognitive state. We have some ideas of the mechanisms. Yeah, I think that's, that is what I think is so interesting because you, you talk about how the brain affects breathing and controls breathing, but there's also how the breathing affects the brain. And I think that's sort of what you're talked about that last se sentence there. And, you know, whether it's uh, biofeedback and heart rate variability or maybe even slowing down brain waves or like, what do you, what do you think are some of the mechanisms or, or con connections of how breathing can improve health from whether, you know, some of the ones I mentioned or others. So let's stipulate, I'll stipulate that breath work has a positive effect. The question is, how is that manifested? Uh, I'm going to talk about this in more detail in my talk, but let me see if I can briefly summarize it. The signal processing in the brain works very much by having background oscillations, that is, things that are rhythmic. And you might ask, what purpose that it does that serve? But let's take this example. I'm talking to you. You hear my voice. It's coming in through your ears, into your auditory cortex, but you're also seeing me coming in through your retina, into your visual cortex. Those are completely different parts of the brain. But what you're seeing or what you're uh, sensing 
is one coherent whole. And the question is, how does the brain make that coherence? Well, one way that seems to be important is that on top of the activity that's coming in through your ears and your eyes, there's a background oscillation. And when the signals from your eyes and your ears converge, the place that converges is very sensitive to how the timing of those signals. If the timing of those signals are a little bit off, the brain doesn't pay as much attention to it. If they're very aligned, the brain pays attention to it. So how do you assure that they're aligned? Well, if both parts of the brain are oscillating and you put the signal on the peak of the oscillations, then when they get to the place where they converge, they're going to be riding on the peak of the, it's going to know it's going to on the peak of the oscillation and say that those two things relate to each other. Whereas if they were a little discordant, like the background din here, the background din, you're not confusing that with what's coming out of my mouth because it's not coordinated with those oscillations and the signals coming from me. Well, it's so interesting. And, and you're, you clearly, you know, have a lot of knowledge about the mechanisms. And, but I think what a lot of people want to know is what can I do with my breathing? Like what, what can I do to control my breathing, to help things in certain ways? Do you have like a, a go-to breathing exercise that you like to tell people to try that might be helpful? Well, there's one more thing I need to say about why we think it works. So this signal processing based on these oscillations, there are lots of different oscillations in the brain. Some are very fast, up to 100 per second. Some are relatively slow in humans, about four per second. But breathing is about once every five seconds. But over the past maybe two decades, scientists have found there are lots of rhythms that are breathing related throughout the whole brain. And so the idea is that these breathing signals are also playing a role in this signal processing, this binding process. Now, of all these rhythms, the only one you could change is your breathing rhythm. So now you change it, and what's happening is that these signals that are involved in these complex circuits get a little, get disrupted. And if it's something that you want to disrupt, for example, a bad emotion, a bad state like anxiety or depression, this will disrupt it, well, hypothesis, it disrupts it. And the brain has an interesting process. When its normal signaling gets disrupted, it can reduce the activity in that circuit. And so if you have a circuit that's responsible for depression and it doesn't go away, then your breathing practice will affect one of the key, key rhythms that's responsible for it. And by disrupting that, it will, it, we predict, will lower that strength of that circuit and you'll feel better. Now, as far as what practice works best, I'm not, that's really outside of my expertise. Um, and it's also partly the fact that, as I'll talk about in my lecture, there are many different ways that signals related to breathing get into the brain. Clearly, it's generated within the brain, so that signal gets radiated. Uh, it comes in through the nose. So the, your nasal signal is respiratory modulated simply by the fact you're breathing through your nose. That is a powerful signal to the brain. So when you smell something, you may smell it as a tonic thing, like you smell a flower rose, but actually what the brain is receiving is a signal that's modulated by your breathing. And it's decoding that and you're not seeing that oscillation, you're seeing something that's continuous. So olfaction is another way that it's coming through. Um, it's coming through the regulation of oxygen and carbon dioxide, and on and on, and I'll, I will talk about this more in my lecture. So as far as practice goes, what I tell my friends is that picture someone who doesn't exercise. Picture someone who doesn't exercise. They're, they, and we know exercise is incredibly beneficial, and they say, what do I do? And I say, get off your butt, and do something simple, just walk. Not too stressful, something you feel comfortable with. And then once you get into the, the regime where you're walking regularly, you can up the ante a little bit. You can walk faster, you can walk uphill, maybe start running. And then you may get to the point where you say, gee, I realize I feel better, 
this exercise is really good. But there are certain things I'd like to accomplish with my exercise. I want more strength. I want more power. I want more endurance. And that leads you in different directions in terms of what your exercise regimen would be. And I think it's very much the same with breathing that you can, there are some of the breathing practices require, require skill and practice. And that's not something that someone could easily jump into. But there are very simple breathing practices that really, I think, really work. The one that I recommend is called box breathing. It's very simple. It's you breathe in slowly, you hold, you exhale slowly, and you hold. And you may go four seconds, four seconds, four seconds, four seconds. So it's 16 seconds to go around that's basically four breaths per minute. Normally you're breathing 12 to 15 breaths per minute. So it's really slowing your breathing down. And if you do it for five, 10 minutes, it's not that most people find it tolerable or actually relaxing. And then see how you feel and do it five minutes a day for a couple of days. And if it's okay, or even if you don't feel anything, do it for a little bit longer. And then most of the people I've suggested to find that it's beneficial. And I say, okay, now you could start digging deeper. And I should say about box breathing is that Navy SEALs are reputed to use box breathing as a way they deal with stressful situations. And the rumor has it, the stressful situations they deal with are much more immediate than most of us have to deal with. I think that's great advice because, you know, it, it's almost like a, a meditation and a mindfulness. And some people there's a barrier to getting to, to mindfulness and meditation that they're just not quite there. But if you just say, it's just breathing, just do this box breathing. It really sort of gets you in that mindful state and just helps you relax and slow things down, which is helpful on so many different levels. And if the breath level itself has a direct contribution, that's even better. Yeah. So I, uh, I, it's, it's a long story, but I learned from some experts about mindfulness meditation and one of the things I was interested in was there was a was the breathing component critical. There was a breathing component could still be could still be just a distraction, you know, focus on this thing mentally and breathe slowly as a distraction from the the world. And you know, you could be asked to just wiggle your finger as a distraction, but after ta while taking the course and speaking to my fellow classmates, I really became convinced that the breathing component was really critical. And that got me motivated to try and figure out ways to see how it could actually demonstrate it. It's, it's not a placebo effect. It's, it's real. And the question is, how can we demonstrate it's real? So we've been doing experiments in mice to teach mice or to get mice to breathe slowly on command. And after three years, we figured it out. So we can get mice to breathe, we'll wake mice uninstrumented to breathe slowly. And when we do that for 30 minutes a day for, I think we've done it four weeks. Now, mice, my mice don't have a placebo effect. After four weeks, the response to what would be a fearful stimulus is much less significantly less. So we think that this, when we eventually, when we get around to publishing it, will be a major breakthrough because it will allow us to, not us, but other people interested in this problem to really understand what, how this is being accomplished. And not only satisfying our curiosity, but finding ways that we might be able to leverage it more. Moreover, I think once we are able to sort of publish that this is a phenomena in rodents, people who would benefit from it would, will no longer say, well, this is some woo-woo thing that people out on the fringe do, that this is a bona fide uh, use, a bona fide hack, if I will, of the normal body. It's not hard, doesn't involve any major, you know, any pharmacological manipulations. It's easy to do, it's no cost. Give it a try, and you know if it doesn't work for you, no harm done. Right, the ultimate you know low barrier of entry, and I, I'm sure it's another fascinating story how you train the mice to breathe slowly. I want to hear that another time for sure. But thank you for explaining all this and for giving us the background of what you're going to talk about. I mean, it just shows the 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 breadth of topics that we have here at Metabolic Health Summit. Like I said, nutrition and exercise and breathing. So thank you very much, and stay tuned for more interviews as we go live from Metabolic Health 2022. Great, thank you very much.
Yeah. Yeah. All right, welcome back. Live streaming from Metabolic Health Summit 2022 here in Santa Barbara, California. And now I'm joined by Dr. Tommy Wood. Now, if you're a fan of the Diet Doctor podcast, you already know who Dr. Tommy Wood is because we had a great episode. And so many different areas of expertise, which I love, because later you're talking about muscle and cognition and mental health. But our keynote speaker last night was speaking about lipopolysaccharides, basically endotoxins that can get through our gut barrier and even through like maybe the blood brain barrier. But unbeknownst to the speaker, we have a researcher who's done research on endotoxins. And so give us your thoughts sort of on, on the talk, but more importantly, the role of, of lipopolysaccharides in health and what we can do about it or what we need to do about it. Sure. So lipopolysaccharides are constituents of the wall um, of a certain type of bacteria in the gut, a whole bunch of different bacteria in the gut. And they stimulate inflammation. And so... When I'm doing certain brain injury models in the lab, I use LPS from E. coli to, to do that. Um, and so if you sort of isolate LPS and you give it to animals, or you give it to humans, it creates this big inflammatory response. We know that when we eat, when we exercise, when we get stressed, uh, the gut becomes a little bit more permeable. We get a little bit more of these products coming from the bacteria in the gut, circulating around. And so the talk was about how this can have a negative effect um, on our health, on cardiovascular disease. And, you know, that's true to an extent, but there are a whole bunch of bacteria in the gut and they communicate with us. And one of the ways they communicate with us is by us detecting these lipopolysaccharides. And like I said, it happens every time we have a meal, some of this stuff comes across and it helps us survey like what's going on in there. And some of these can actually be beneficial. So when you're talking about this one from E. coli, yes, it's pro-inflammatory, but there's a whole bunch of them that may be beneficial. So it's, it's not... It's just that we shouldn't focus on this one pathway because actually there's a whole bunch of you know maybe useful stuff that's going on there. Um, and at the same time, when you talk about the detrimental effects of LPS, they um, they might only be a problem in the setting of insulin resistance. So for two reasons that I can think of, but maybe more. Uh, so like I said, when you after a meal you have this big spike in um, LPS, you actually get a spike of inflammation with every meal. It's completely normal. And insulin, part of what insulin does as it spikes after a meal is it sort of shuts down this pro-inflammatory part of the pathway. But that anti-inflammatory effect of insulin doesn't happen if you're insulin resistant. And similarly, um, LPS binds to small or binds to LDL particles or all APOB containing lipoproteins. Um, and it's, that's actually how we clear it. However, if you have small dense particles, which are much more common if you're insulin resistant, it's much harder to clear them. So you end up with more LPS circulating around and it can cause inflammation. So I used to be really personally focused on LPS because it, it you know it does create inflammation. It can cause all the, these issues. But if you do all the things that we know we can do to improve insulin resistance, I think that actually we have to accept that LPS is a part of normal life. You know, It comes from the gut. It's part of the bacteria. They're part of us. We know they're beneficial. Um, and so I think focusing on insulin resistance gives us a much sort of easier target that we sort of understand and that's something that can maybe translate to help people figure out what to do yeah that's so interesting to draw the connection with insulin resistance because a lot of the things that we can do that supposedly help with lps also help with insulin resistance in the way you change your diet or exercise or so forth so do you think that's part of the connection of why those things help um it absolutely could be um and pretty much uh gastric bypass surgery uh weight loss um, you know, pretty much any medication that improves uh, insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes, all of these things also reduce circulating LPS and the amount that comes up. So there's probably like a bi-directional thing there. Um, but, you know, if we're trying to think of things that we can focus on, there are a whole bunch of things that we can do to improve body composition, metabolic health. And when we do that, LPS is going to come down naturally. And it, the other part about it, that it, you can get an increase in LPS even with exercise, so something beneficial. And it's, I mean, I guess it's maybe a little bit of a weak analogy, but sort of like, you know, stress is like bad, but you're not going to finish that term paper if you're not stressed, right? Inflammation is bad. Well, it's really the chronic inflammation, not, not acute inflammation from an infection. So it could be sort of the same with LPS, like a little bit leaking in is actually a good thing, a good signal. And it's when it hits a certain point, the dose makes the poison, whatever the analogy or with the background insulin resistance that then we're concerned about it. So one of the things that I think was a maybe not such a good aha moment from from her from uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick's talk last night was that fat 
you know, whether it's cream or e eating fat can increase LPS. So for a crowd that's eating a ketogenic diet, that's a little scary. So how do you, how do you rectify that, that fat increases LPS, but ketogenic diets can be so beneficial for a lot of the things we're concerned about with LPS? Yeah, it, it's a good question and it's true. So experimentally, if I make you drink a bunch of heavy cream, you're going to have a big bunch of LPS come into the system. Um, and the LPS is sort of transported along with fat into chylomicrons, sort of in that in, in the system that is used to transport lipids as energy. Um, so if you were purely focused on LPS, you might think that this is a bad thing. Um, and I'm not a big fan of people drinking a bunch of heavy cream. So like, maybe that's okay. Um, but uh, because so, so again, if we focused on LPS as the thing, we might say, well, therefore, fat is bad. Um, but similarly, if, you, if, you're, if you're consuming a bunch of fat as part of a, a low-carb or keto diet, and it's improving body composition, it's improving metabolic health, that your total burden of LPS, I think, is still going to decrease quite significantly. So, And what um, Dr. Patrick did say at the end is that she's less concerned about these sort of intermittent spikes like you might get from eating a high fat meal and more about this sort of like chronic continuous exposure. And that's where you get your know, LPS that doesn't get cleared because it's attached to small LDL particles. So, so yeah, I think we um, just as long as people aren't hyper focused on minimizing LPS as much as possible, you know, not getting any into the system, which is basically that's never going to happen. It's a completely unrealistic goal. You would you like you'd never eat, you never exercise, you never do any of these things. Right. So, so I think if we focus on the, the health component you know, all that kind of other stuff will start to take care of itself. Yeah, that's so good to put in perspective. And and again, this is sort of the benefit of being here at Metabolic Health Summit, that, that you're speaking on something totally different, but he's an expert on this topic and so can add so much extra information um, to an already good talk. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I really look forward to hearing your talk later today. All right. So stick with us. We'll be back more uh, streaming live from Metabolic Health Summit 2022. Awesome. That was great. Thank, thank you very, very much. much.